The practices of utilitarianism have been around for quite a while, but it was Jeremy Bentham, who lived between 1748 to 1832, who actually brought it together as a school of thought. Now, all these years later, there are many different approaches to utilitarianism, but lots of the thinking actually underpin healthcare, social care, and our ethical uh, systems. Utilitarianism, or otherwise called consequentialism, places greatest emphasis on the outcome or consequences of a particular action. That is, that something produces or aims to produce the maximum good. This is a system of outcomes and consequences judged what's in the best interest to be good. A good example is effectively teaching a full range of comprehensive, safer, sexual and contraceptive matters to young people that this in itself is good because it will save on all aspects of poor outcomes, of unintended consequences of unprotected or condomless sex if they do not have all the facts and the knowledge. Therefore, teaching this equal to everyone is good, irrespective of their individual belief systems. Immanuel Kant was a German philosopher of the 18th century. He invented a school of thought called critical philosophy, and in particular deontology, or deontological ethics. The etymology, or the origins of the word deontology, come from two Greek concepts. Deon is from a moral duty, or an obligation, whereas logia comes from discourse, words, the study of something. So deontology is the study of moral duties and obligations. Deontological ethics are totally different to utilitarianism, which looks for the greatest good for the maximum number. Deontology is rule-based. It means adhering to obligations or what is considered to be right or dutiful. Therefore, this is referred to as normative ethics. A good example here is of a case that fortunately we no longer see in the UK but still may happen in other parts of the world where a new mother with um, HIV and a high viral load refuses antiretroviral therapies for herself and her baby because she believes it's God's will to take care of them both. She also insists on breastfeeding despite medical opinion because she believes breast is best. Despite the greatest good for the greatest number with utilitarianism or consequentialism, deontology would actually uphold this mother's rights and position here on a number of accounts. For example, her individual autonomy and decision making. Also upholding her right to personal beliefs and a moral duty to respect the autonomy of this particular individual. To share your learning with us on these points, think about these two very different ethical systems and then try to apply them both uh, from their two different starting points and outcomes to particular issues within your own field of practice and then share that learning with the rest of us, if not in class, then certainly in the online forum. If utilitarianism or deontology tend to inform so many social codes of ethics or personal moral belief systems, then what role do you think our professional codes of conduct can play, especially in relation to health and social care research? Many professional codes of conduct or practice actually form around these four guiding principles for good health care provision. The first guiding principle is to do good, beneficence, bene facere, to do good. And that means enhancing the interests and happiness of others, always acting in their best interests, protecting and defending their rights, and removing any conditions that may cause them harm. Beneficence, to do good. Again, another term from Latin, in this case, non-maleficence, non meaning not, male, bad or evil, and facere to do. So it's an obligation not to intentionally kill, harm, cause suffering, cause offence, or deprive others of the goods of life. 
It's worth remembering here, though, that beneficence and non-maleficence often coincide. For example, sticking a needle into somebody may actually hurt them, but it's for their greater good to give them a particular needed medication or treatment. Autonomy often refers to the capacity of a person to make reasoned choices on the basis of information given. For example, allowing individuals to think, decide and act freely and independently. For us as health and social care professionals, telling the truth, respecting the privacy of others, protecting their information and obtaining consent from them in relation to any intervention we will do. Finally, the ethical principle of justice, whereby we treat others freely and equitably. We distribute the burdens and benefits fairly, and we resolve disputes fairly. The, the ethical principles of care are not always as clear-cut as they at first sound, because there can be opportunities when they conflict with one another. This can be in decision-making, say for example around chemotherapy, vaccinations, and drug trials, abortion, euthanasia, withdrawal of treatment, conflict with issues around capacity and self-determination.